Father, as we come <clears throat> together today, we're grateful to be your, your church family here. I'm thankful for those that call UFC their home and come to uh, fellowship with each other and uh, worship you and learn from your word. And I'd ask that you'd change us so that we would not remain the same as a result of our times together each week. I pray that you would build deeper and deeper relationships between us and that you would use those to refine us and cause us to be more like you, to walk more uh, deeply in the power of your spirit. And so we want to make a, a difference with our lives. And sometimes we don't know how to do that, so we ask for your guidance on that for sure. Pray for those that are suffering. I know there's a number of them in our, in our body that are hurting today. Um, ask that you come alongside and comfort them. We're grateful for the good news on Lou and for a few others I've talked to this morning who have received uh, good reports from their doctors. And uh, ask you help us not to cling too hard to this life, but to recognize that we live for an eternal purpose. Uh, we pray for our nation, <clears throat> and we recognize it's in turmoil in many ways, and uh, we think about the decisions that we've heard about recently and choices that people have made and uh, gridlock in our nation's capital, and I frankly don't even know how to pray most of the time, but would ask, Lord, that you'd continue to give us the ability to live at peace and that we could proclaim the gospel and that as, as your church we could rise and do what you've called us to do. But we have been commanded to pray for our leaders, so we do that this morning and ask your blessing on them, ask your wisdom in their life, uh, that you would uh, convict and, and change and do what needs to be done on behalf of our nation. We do pray for Haiti this morning and um, we're grateful that we get to partner with the church planning operations and the, and the uh, orphanage there. We ask your physical protection over them, uh, over Brick and his team, that you'd watch over them as they are performing uh, medical, uh, giving medical help to those that need it so desperately. We ask this morning that you'd use your word in our lives and help me to preach well. Thank you for the privilege of being together today. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to thank uh, Craig for preaching last week. I, I said it in my weekly email. If you don't get that, you can sign up for it over at the Connect table or uh, go online and just make an account on our webpage. <clears throat> but I always enjoy getting a, a chance to sit in the crowd and heckle like the rest of you do. And uh, I enjoyed last week. And every time somebody fills in for me, they do a great job. So thanks for that. Um, we are picking it up in Mark uh, chapter 3. And I'm going to start in verse 7. But before I'll do, I'll just give a little bit of background as to where we are in this process. Um, we're about a year into Jesus' ministry. Um, he has sort of, in, in the minds of the religious leadership of the Jewish world, he has caused offense time and time again. In the most recent ways is he, uh, he associated with a tax collector named Levi and went to Levi's home and entered into a dinner with all of Levi's scoundrel friends, and this was just an absolute no-no for the religious establishment. Levi later became Matthew and wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, he and his disciples were walking on a Sabbath through a wheat field, and they were gleaning wheat in their hands and snacking on wheat. And, of course, the Pharisees that were following them were keeping track of all the offenses on the Sabbath, and that was a problem. And then lastly, he, he healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. And this is causing great conflict between he and the religious leadership to the point, if you look at verse 6, it says, the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. And that destroy doesn't mean just, you know, hurt his ministry, it means kill him. And the Herodians, you recognize the name as King Herod, uh, they were Jewish. <clears throat> uh, uh, the Herodian family was a Jewish family that served uh, Rome. Uh, he was the governor over the region of Judea. And that, that they and the Pharisees would come together to try to defeat and destroy Jesus is quite remarkable because these two were vicious enemies toward one another. But now they had a common cause, and that's to destroy Jesus. So verse 7 now, uh, I'll just read the first uh, six verses here. It says, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed. 
and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because the crowd, so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. And he would earnestly warn them not to tell who he was. So Jesus makes a decision here. He withdraws to the sea. Um, this in, Earlier in chapter 3, we don't know where he is, but he's teaching in a synagogue on the Sunday when, when he heals the man. And now he's come back to the Sea of Galilee. He's withdrawn from the crowds. And the crowds, we get a, we get a sense here for what's happening. Um, great multitudes, it says in verse 7, are pressing in around him. Now we're going to, when we get, as we continue through Mark, we'll, we'll come to a day when he, re, when he feeds 5,000 and another day when he feeds 4,000. And the way they counted heads in those days is they only counted the men. They didn't count the women and the children. So historians would believe that at any given time when Jesus is in public space preaching and teaching, there could be as many as 10,000 people gathered around him. Get your head around that for a second. There's about 6,000 in here right now. <laughs> Whenever a pastor gives you a number, you better be careful. I don't know if you watched the Super Bowl last, or Super Bowl last Sunday. <laughs> But man, that was a boring football game with really marginal commercials. And I don't know about you, but I didn't like the outcome. But what I noticed at the end of the game, if you watch the after interviews, Tom Brady was just crushed by people. I don't know how many of you saw that, but I mean, he literally could not move. There were people around him crushing him with microphones and people were in danger of being hurt. And I was thinking about this passage because I'm guessing that's Jesus' daily experience as he ministered to the crowds. People were there because, as, as we're learning, they were there because he was healing and sick people wanted to be around him, wanted to touch him, wanted to be a part of that experience. And they were crushing in around him. Actually, the word is in verse 9 there, it says, because of the crowd, they were crowding him, they were crushing him. And it, to the point where he said, listen, we need an escape vehicle here. Uh, we need a Galilean getaway car, which happens to be a boat. And he says, bring a boat, because I could get crushed here, and I'm, I need some way to get out of these crowds. Now, Mark gives us the region, which if you ever have the time, well, you always have the time. If you ever take the opportunity to turn to the back of your Bible, don't do it now and uh, look at the map, you can see the regions that Mark is talking about. So let me just run through them real quickly. Galilee uh, is a region to the north, and then Judea is the southern region of Israel. Uh, Jerusalem we're familiar with as a, as a town. Idumea is a region that's south of Judea, so we're, we're talking all the way from the southern end of Israel to the northern end. When it says beyond the Jordan, that's on the east side of the Jordan, which tends to be desert and wilderness, which is where John the Baptist did the majority of his ministry. So all of, all of eastern Israel is, is accounted for here. And then he says Tyre and Sidon, those are seaport cities up in the north, the very north, uh, primarily Gentile cities. So when you add all this up, there are people from every nook and cranny of the nation crowding around Jesus. To give you a sense of perspective, uh, the nation of Israel is basically about 170 miles long, so it'd be like from Portland to Roseburg, and it's about 60 miles wide at its widest, which would be from Eugene to Florence. So if you take the Willamette Valley and, and, and add some of the coast range to it, you sort of have the nation of Israel. So it seems like quick travel to us, but of course they did it on foot. So every time they made a move, it was a long and uh, cumbersome, you know, sort of a burdensome travel. And people were coming from everywhere to be around him. And his public success was being uh, seen by all. And it's being a little bit problematic in, in this fashion. Um, there seems to be two things that are happening primarily. The first one is this, is that he's healing like crazy. Um, all kinds of healings are happening, and so the word is getting out, and sick and 
sick people and those that are crippled and blind and every kind of issue come to him. And he's, he's healing, many of which Mark records, but I'm sure there are hundreds if not thousands that are not recorded in the pages of Scripture. And the second thing that's happening is that for some odd reason, those that are demon-possessed are coming into his orbit. Now, he, he would, Jesus would be the arch enemy to those that are possessed by demons. And yet demons, it's incumbent. For some reason, they come into his presence and they fall down and they declare who he is. And from the very beginning, they have been accurate in their declarations. And today, Mark records, they're declaring that you are the Son of God. And so he, he earnestly warns them, he tells them not to, to speak about who he is. So a couple of things come to play here. First, because the Herodians and the Pharisees have teamed up against him, Jesus is withdrawing from them. He's trying to, to bide some time. He knows that his final outcome leads to a cross, but he knows the timing is not yet right. And so he draws away from those that are plotting against him. And then secondarily, he's, he's now being overwhelmed by the crowds. And I think he understands that crowds are not necessarily a mark of success. I mean, think about it. If there are tens of thousands here with him in these crowded arena, you know, these teaching spaces that he's in. How many of those tens of thousands were with him at the cross? They abandoned him. In fact, those that remained were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus recognized that public success was not equivalent to personal repentance and building the kingdom of God. There's a little lesson for us in this, I think. We need to be very careful, as Jesus was. He, he did what he was called to do in his, his healings and his preaching of repentance and his proclaiming of the gospel was what he was doing, but people were not responding to it. All they wanted was the temporary gain of a healing and later of free food, but they were unwilling to repent and become a part of the kingdom and follow him in faith. And he knew this, and so he recognized that drawing large crowds, as attractive as that can be, as uh, good for the ego as that might be, that's not what Jesus was about. And so he needs to shift his direction. He, needs to, he does shift his direction. For us, I think it raises a couple of thoughts or, or comments. At least it does for me. First, we're not judged by the fruitfulness of our ministry necessarily. We're judged by our faithfulness to our call. You see, Jesus, if you looked at the fruitfulness of his ministry right here and right now, you wouldn't see a lot. You'd see big crowds wanting free stuff but not a lot of repentance, not a lot of life change. And when it came right down to it on the day of the cross, none of these people were to be found. If you judged Jesus by the fruitfulness of his ministry, despite the large crowds, you'd say, I don't know if it was effective or not. But you have to judge him by the faithfulness to his call. And his call was to march to the cross and give his life a ransom for us all. So for you and for me... And for those of you, especially I'll look to the college crowd, for those of you that are maybe considering the ministry in the future, for those that are caring about the souls of their neighbors in this crowd, there's a temptation to feel like we're defeated because we're not seeing fruit. I want us to change that paradigm and say, if we are faithful to what God calls us to do, that's all he asks of us. We have no control over the fruit. That's his doing. Who he, who he calls to faith, how they repent, how their life changes, that's God's doing. Our call is to be faithful to him and to proclaim him and to do the work of the ministry in the realms that he has given us. So for those that are thinking about a lifetime of ministry, it's wonderful to have a full auditorium like this, but really what we're called to do and to be is to be faithful to the gospel and proclaim it. And the second thing I'd note for this is there's a temptation to keep crowds. And Jesus, he, this was not a temptation for him. If it was, he didn't succumb to it. He's going to continue to preach the gospel, and his gospel was a gospel of repentance and turn to the kingdom and follow me. 
He, he wasn't going to change anything to keep and maintain the crowd. There, there is a temptation in, in the American church today to preach a gospel that's easy to listen to. And I think we fall victim of that. And we preach a gospel that's all about the blessings of the here and now. It's all about the eternal life, which is true. But the reality of the gospel says that we come to him and he is now our king and we are his subjects. And what he tells us to do, we must do. And that gospel contains in it life change. It contains in it obedience. It contains in it turning away from sin. It contains walking away from temptation. Those are not popular things to preach. They're not popular for people to hear. And the temptation is to say, well, we can't preach that kind of truthful gospel because the crowds will dissipate. Yep, they will. We are judged by our faithfulness to the call. And we need to preach the gospel in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. The word of God needs to be proclaimed. And that's what God has called us to do. So Jesus has seen great public success. But he's not being fooled by that. He recognizes that's not what it takes to reach the world with the gospel. So, look at verse 13. And he went up on the mountain, and he summoned those to himself whom he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed the twelve so that they would be with him, and he could send them out to preach, and to have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Sons of Thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. See, Jesus was experiencing tremendous public success but he realized, I keep saying this like, like he's you know, learning these things. You understand this is God. <laughs> I'm just reporting the facts. Jesus understood that public success wasn't going to win the gospel. It had to be a private call. It, there had to be private selection. He, he, out of all the masses that were following him, he made a decision to call 12 men to walk in obedience to him. I want to look at this just a little bit. Um, the standard procedure for application to serve a rabbi during Jesus' day was, and there were rabbis, Jewish teachers, men who had schools, and there was a desire to sit under their teaching and be a part of their philosophy and part of their mindset and, and come away trained so that you too could have a synagogue and you too could teach in a, in a rabbinical school, that you could have a following and so men, women were not allowed to, but men applied to rabbinical opportunities and they would go to their rabbi, in essence, with a resume. And they would say, I want to serve under you, I want to study under you, here's who, here's who I am, here's what my education has been to this point, here's who my parents are, this is the influence I have in the community, I, I want to be one of your students. And the rabbi then would look at the resumes, so to speak, and he would choose the best and the brightest. Does that sound familiar? It, pretty much the way life works for us, isn't it? Um, uh, there's a reason I didn't go to Harvard. I went to the Harvard of the West Coast, Portland State University. <laughs> but that's the application process. But Jesus throws that on its ear. He's not asking for applications. He's not looking for resumes and CVs. He's he is choosing those that he wants to follow him. And in so doing, his choices, uh, it, it's a slap in the face to the Jewish community. He's doing the complete opposite of what every other rabbi would do. Every other rabbi would want the best and the brightest studying under him if for no other reason he could point to the other rabbis and sort of sneer that he's, he's, got the, he's sort of the Tom Brady of rabbis, okay? I've got the best and the brightest, I win all the trophies. Jesus wasn't going to do it that way. And in so doing, he slaps that system in the face because he didn't choose any of the best and brightest. None of these men had formal Jewish 
education in, in the sense that they had been through rabbinical school. They, they were common laborers. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. One was a zealot. They were not what you would suspect or expect Jesus to choose. And in so doing, he is, he's literally, again, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, they had a way of thinking in their world, and Jesus is again rocking that world, and he'll have nothing to do with it. And this pushes against them. It, it really is a condemnation to their approach to religion. And he's choosing 12 based on what he, he sees in their hearts, not based on what's written on a piece of paper. Now, he... He's choosing them because they are ordinary, because they're normal, because they're just regular people, uh, very much like everyone in this room. Paul puts it this way. He says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame that which is strong. He's chosen the base things of the world and the, despi and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. God's choosing, Jesus' choosing of the twelve is really a picture of what Paul just said. He, he chose the, the blue collar, the uneducated, the rough around the edges, socially a little bit on the outside. They were nothing special. He chose them, and he uses people like that, and in so doing, he receives the glory. He, 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 it's obvious that God is working through people like me and people like you. Just a little bit about these men. When he uh, chose them, and, and whenever we see them, they're listed in three teams, the A team, the B team, and the C team. The A team is always led by Peter. And Peter is, he's the leader of all the disciples. His name always comes first. Um, in Peter's team, the A team is his brother Andrew and brothers James and John. So in every gospel, when the disciples are listed, those four always come first, and Peter is always the leader. The second team is the B team, which is Philip. He's always the leader of the B team. And then there's Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas. And then lastly, there's the C team, which is led by James and has Thaddeus, Simon, and Judas. Uh, C team sort of got shortchanged with Judas there. Um, speaking of Judas, this did not catch Jesus off guard. He didn't choose Judas and then go later, oh man, I had no idea he was going to betray me. Jesus had clear understanding that Judas was going to betray him. That was part of the plan. It was part of God's eternal plan that Judas would be fulfilling Old Testament prophecy and betray him. One might ask the question, well, then does that exonerate Judas of any guilt? And the answer is no. Uh, Jesus is fully aware of Judas' betrayal, and Judas is fully accountable for his betrayal. Those two things are not contradictory. They actually fit together. And so don't have sympathy on Judas as though he's being used as a pawn by God. Judas made moral decisions all the way along to do what it is he did, and God holds us accountable for our decisions. Does God use those decisions to accomplish his purposes? Sometimes he does, yes. But we are still held accountable for those things. So Jesus isn't wringing his hands about Judas. And this is an astounding thing. For the, for the years that they were together, Jesus loved Judas just like he loved Peter. There was no differentiation between the two. Now, there was, there was how they spent their time. If you're in Team A, you spent more time with Jesus. There's just no getting around it. There is more ink about you in the New Testament than there is on those in Team B or C. But the love that Jesus had for all 12 of these men was equal. And that's an astounding thing when you know one of them is going to betray you and lead you to the cross. But that just demonstrates God's character and it should give peace to those of us that have sinned, those of us that know we're sinners, that we have no doubt about our darkness. Jesus loves us just the same as the guy next to us. And guess what? The guy next to us, his sin is just as dark as ours. I was sharing with a friend this week that sin is absolute in God's mind. It's not relative. 
Um, tonight I'll head up to prison and I sit right next to my buddy and he killed his wife's lover with his bare hands. He's never getting out of prison. He's a great guy. I, I enjoy being with him. He's one of the more mature believers in my chapel. Um, but he's a murderer, an aggravated murderer, never getting out. And guess what? His sin and my sin put us in the same spot. Now, his has a greater consequence socially. His has a greater consequence in the fact that he's never getting out of the state prison. But his sin separates him from a holy God, and my sin separates me from a holy God. They're both poison. You drink, drink either one of them, it's going to kill you. And God loves us both. Don't ever get caught up in the idea that because my sins are so great, God cannot love me. Or because I didn't sin very much, I don't need a Savior. They're both lies from the pit of hell. We're both broken, and Jesus saves us all. Okay? Now, here's an interesting thing, too, to note. <clears throat> Jesus is calling these men to certain death. <laughs> he knows that every one of these men is going to die for the cause. And yet he says, come, follow me. Come join me. Let me train you. Let me invest my life into you. He, he is calling them to certain death. Listen to this. this is, I'm going to read a little bit here. It says, The only apostle whose death the Bible records is James. King Herod had James put to death with the sword, likely, likely a reference to beheading. The circumstances of deaths of the other apostles are related through church tradition. So we shouldn't put too much weight on other accounts, but here's what's commonly accepted in church tradition. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome in the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy about him. And he followed the most popular traditions concerning the death, and, and here are the traditions concerning the other deaths. Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia. He was killed by a sword wound. John faced martyrdom when he was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil a wave of, during a wave of persecution in Rome. However, he miraculously was delivered from death, and John was then sentenced to the mines on the prison of the island Patmos. He wrote his prophetic book of Revelation on Patmos. The apostle John was later freed and returned to what is now modern-day Turkey. He died as an old man, the only apostle to die peacefully, if you can call boiled in oil peaceful. James, the brother of Jesus, who was not officially an apostle, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was thrown from the southeast pinnacle of the temple over a hundred feet down when he refused to deny his faith. When they discovered that he had survived, his enemies beat James to death with a club. It's thought that's the same pinnacle where Satan had taken Jesus during the temptation. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, was a missionary to Asia. He witnessed in present-day Turkey and was martyred for preaching in Armenia, being flayed to death by a whip. Andrew, they tied his body to the cross with cords. Uh, excuse me, Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. After seven soldiers whipped Andrew severely and tied his body to the cross, uh, the followers reported that he was led to the cross. Andrew saluted in these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. He continued to preach to his tormentors for two days until he died. The apostle uh, Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips to establish the church. Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace the traitor Judas Iscariot, was stoned and then beheaded. The apostle Paul was tortured and then beheaded by the evil emperor Nero. Um, so that's what these men were being called to. I don't know how you would respond to that. If you were in Jesus' position, let's say you're recruiting people to join your company, and you know that joining your company will cost them their lives, you'd have to be fairly convinced that the work your company does is important, and you'd have to be fairly convinced that there's more to life than the here and now. And Jesus has no hesitations in calling these 12 men to follow him, to give up their life, because what they lose here, they will gain in eternity. And here's the thing. He calls us to follow him. We don't apply for the job. 
We don't fill out resumes and say, God, here's why I think you want me. Let me just be real clear with you here. We don't apply for the job. The Spirit of God reaches into our black hearts, and he converts us, and he calls us to himself, and we become disciples of Jesus. What does that mean for us? It could mean persecution, separation, alienation, and death. Are you convinced that the work you're being called to is important enough to say yes? And are you convinced that should you die an early death because of the work and the calling of the gospel, that your eternal life is secure? Is secure? I look at this passage, and I am very much heartened that Jesus knowingly called men to die for him because he knew that was a better outcome than living apart from him. Well, what did he call him to do? Uh, he, he says, take a look at uh, verse 14. And he appointed the twelve so that they would be with him and he could send them out to preach. Jesus is calling the twelve. He says, come be with me. Out of all the thousands... He's chosen 12. Now we will see, and we'll see shortly here, that he, he invests in training them. He gives them, uh, he's with them all the time. They watch him eat. They watch him interact with people. They watch him pray for people. They watch him heal the sick and cast out demons. They watch him deal with these overwhelming, pressing crowds. They get to see Jesus and learn not only from his teaching, but from his actions and his life. They pray with him. They have access to him all the time. It, this is like a 24-hour school for the next two years. And he is preparing these men to take the gospel to the world. But to do that, he says, come be with me. Be with me. This with me, it, it has this sense that I want to have a relationship with you. I'm going to be different than the other rabbis. This is not like seminary. This is not like graduate school. This is not like college. This is, you're going to be with me. You're going to live with me, walk with me, eat with me, pray with me, listen to me, ask me questions. I'm going to confront you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to have fun with you. I'm going to laugh with you. We're going to tell jokes together. We are going to be in relationship with one another. Well, that part sounds pretty good. I mean, wouldn't it have been something to get to spend two years with the creator of the universe? But then he says, so that I can send you out to preach. Oh, okay, that, that's the harder part. And we get to be with Jesus, but the purpose of being with him is to go out. And these men did their job very well. I just read historical accounts of their death and you realize they were all the way from Ethiopia to Armenia to Egypt. They had traveled the known world taking the gospel and planting churches. And here we sit a couple thousand years later in the far-off Thule's of Oregon. We're, we're proclaiming the name of Jesus. We are being called as his disciples. We are multiplying our lives and investing it in the gospel because those 12 guys... Eleven of them did their job the way they were supposed to. They came and they were with Jesus, and then he sent them out. When he sends them out, we'll, we'll get to this in a little while, in a few chapters too, he, he gives them very specific instructions. He says, here's what you should wear, here's what you should do, here's what you should say, here's how you interact with that culture. He says, and then I want you to come back and report back to me. And when they come back, he takes them away and they refresh and rejuvenate and they hear stories and it's a very thorough training process he he's wanting them to be disciples that know what to do and they know where to go and how to do it now this begs a question for us when we're chosen by god and by his spirit we are called into discipleship you you are not there's not a believer and then there's a disciple you are a disciple 
Everyone that's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is his disciple. You have been called by him. He reached down out of the billions of people on this earth, and he chose you and he chose me to be his disciple. And we're called to be with him. Our spirits are to be drawn to him. We're to seek him in prayer and listen to his word. We're to trust our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our futures to him. We're to prioritize our life around his purposes. We're to hold in our hands loosely that which we once worshipped as idols. Our money, our prestige, our health, our future, our companies, our families. We've got to hold those loosely. They are no longer ours. They are God's. We cannot worship them. We have to give them. We are to build a relationship with him. This is, you've heard it said before, but this is the principle. That we're, this is substantially different than religion. We, we are to know Jesus and to be known by him. We are to be in relationship with him. There is a transparent honesty with God at all times for his disciples. He can address our lives and we can address him. We are to be in relationship with him. Then... We're to be in relationship with his people. We're to form our little teams. They have three of them. The A team, the B team, and the C team. These guys connected together. They served together. There was, we'll find out someday how they fit. It's no mistake, by the way, that 12 were chosen, which was another slap in the face to the Jewish world. There are 12 tribes in the Jude- of Judaism, and they all have a leader. And it's not a Pharisee. It's not a scribe. It's not a Sadducee. It's a tax collector, a fisherman. These 12 guys formed teams. They had connections with each other. They built community. They encouraged one another. They challenged each other. They guided one another, corrected one another. Um, We are to be in community. We are to be in teams. We are to be around men and women that say, yeah, I'm I'm a disciple and I'm going to make a difference with my life. Then we're commanded to go. We're we're to take seriously the second half of this equation. Uh, We're to preach, to take the gospel to others. A few of us are to preach in pulpits. Most of us are to preach with our lives. All of us are to do that. We're to live as a disciple in this world. We're to continue the chain of faith and obedience. We need to find somebody to pour our life into, to teach, to train, If you don't feel competent at that level, then find someone to teach and help and train you. Because it's not, it's really not optional. We're to be with him and we're to go out and preach. So let me ask the honest question. It's a pointed one. How are you doing with this? How are you doing with the be with Jesus? How are you doing with the go out and proclaim? Sometimes we ignore both, if we're going to be honest. There are many Christians that say, you know what, I don't have time for Jesus. I'll show up on Sunday once or twice a month. I'll get 30 minutes of Jesus through Brett. You're in trouble. I'm not going to read my Bible. It makes no sense to me. I don't pray much. I don't know if he's listening. I, you know, I'm, I'm just glad I'm saved. Well, that person has really no heart for the lost, to be blunt. I mean, if we, if, if we don't have the time to be with Jesus, we're not going to go out and risk a great deal for the cause of Christ. If you're in that boat, uh, something needs to change. Second one would be, we focus big time on being with, but we never go out. That's sort of the condition of the, of, of the majority of us in church, to be blunt. I guess I'm being blunt and frank today. Um, we're, we're okay with being with. We'll read our Bibles, we'll pray, we'll come to church, we'll do things Christian-y. But we're not real good about going out. Because going out is risk. That's where death lies. That's where danger is. That's where people make fun of us. That's where I feel awkward. That's where it's just not comfortable for me. I'm, I'm fine being in a church. I mean, I'll even come to a gym. But I really don't want to go out. That's just not what I'm called to do. Then there are those of us that are professional go-outers. I'm in the ministry. I preach. I get paid to do it. I spend time in my office. I'm a go-out guy. 
You know what my weakness is? Spending time with Jesus. Uh, sometimes we get so busy doing, going, building, proclaiming, that we forget that we need to be with him. That's the first step. Be with him. Build that relationship with him, then he will send us out. How are you doing on those things? That it's not just for the 12. You know, to be honest, it, it, to be, if you are with him, he is going to instill his heart in you, and you will start to see your unbelieving friends differently. Now the question is, is are you going to fight it or are you going to go with it? Because if you are with him, if you're reading his word and learning from him, if his spirit is guiding and directing you, if you are praying and connected with other believers, you will have a growing heart for the lost. You, you will begin to shed some fear, not perfectly, but you will say, okay, I, I have got to go out. I, if, a, if I'm a disciple, i got to go and take the gospel to others. And, and being with him in an honest way produces a go. Now, it may not be a fearless one. It may not be a confident one. It may not even be a well-trained one. But if you are with Jesus regularly, he's going to push you out of the nest. He's going to say, go. Uh, we, we help with a church in Iceland, and Gunnar Gunnarsson is the pastor there. He's a great guy. And this week on his Facebook, he wrote this. He said, uh, he said something, and I wrote it down. <laughs> you just take a break there while I find it. <laughs> wow. It's on there somewhere. Basically, he said this, if we underestimate the cost of being a disciple we underestimate the value of discipleship. And if we are, if we are fearful, if, if, if we don't recognize that following Jesus comes at a great cost, we're never going to engage ourselves in the going process of the gospel. So we find ourselves to now confronted. Um, Jesus had this massive public ministry but he said, no, it's about a personal call, and it's investing in a few. And I can't, you know, most of us can't do massive public ministries, but we can invest in a few. Just a couple of thoughts for you before we call it quits today. One would be this. Don't, don't brush over this. Are you with him, and are you going? If you don't know how to do that, what context to do that in, we currently, that one of the easiest steps I could give you would be uh, find a community of other people, like-minded, and start praying together about that. Um, the other thing I could say is we have a mentorship program here. We have college students that we have a commitment to. If they're a part of what we're trying to accomplish and they want to be a part of the team, we are um, giving them mentors, older men and women, that can come speak into their life. Um, that's a first step to say, how can I begin to replicate my life and, and help others? Uh, if you'd like to be involved with that, talk to Jesse or Ashley about that. But don't, don't just sit and say, well, somebody's going to have to call me up. You know, it's going to have to bounce out of the sky. If you are connected to Jesus, he's the one that's going to send you to go. Listen to him. He knows what he's doing, and he knows where to send you. The question is, is will you answer? Let's pray. Father, as we come before you today, we recognize that none of us are equipped. Um, we don't have you know, the gifting and the skills to do what it is that we feel like you've called us to do, but you see us differently. In fact, you, you take delight in the fact that your spirit equips regular people to do amazing things. And for us, the amazing things are not apostolic. We are not healing people and we're not casting out demons. They had a different kind of role in their day. But the amazing thing for us 
is to proclaim the life-giving gospel to those around us that don't know it. We should be doing that with our words, and we should be doing that with our lives. If people come away from us having no concept that we're a follower of yours, that if, in fact, if they come away from us being discouraged about life and faith in God, we, we are not doing our job. So help us to be men and women that say yes to you and are with you, and then we go, and we know that your spirit will lead, and your spirit will be calling men and women to yourself. The fruitfulness is in your court, not ours. But help us to be faithful. Because life is about you. It's, it's about nothing else. So God, we ask for your help in this. Help us to do it together and to do it well. In Jesus' name, amen.